Hi, everybody. We're back at the gathering room, which is in still in New Jersey. Not exactly where I'm going to end up, but I am today. So I hope to start hearing from you guys from all over the planet. It's always so exciting. We show up, it says zero viewers. And then Wendy from Wolf comes. <laughs> Wendy, you are awesome. Samira, hi, hi, hi. How are you doing? Uh, people from, yes, sup, Mercy, sup. Hello, darlings. Hello, Jessica. Hello, Laurel. I love that you're greeting each other, too, because that, oh, 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 look at that puppy from Idaho. Monica from Mexico City. Woo, 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 woo. Yay. Australia. Mm -mm -mm. Land where everything can kill you, so I've heard. Liz Welton, hi. How you doing? It's snowy already in Banff. I know you got to come a little south. Daisy from New Zealand. Hello, Melody. It's beautiful, that picture. Jordy from Melbourne. Look at those beautiful trees behind the beautiful lady. Oh, so good. <sighs> hi, Anne. How you doing? Spider Anne. Spider Anne. Hi, Susan from Ontario. Woo, woo, woo. Natalie, how you doing? I love your photo. You guys are so cool. I have the coolest friends. Hi, Anne-Marie. Ooh, also in New Jersey and from Michigan. Uh -huh. Yay, Pride from DC. Hello, Elizabeth. <sighs> and Lynn and Carol. I don't know where Grass Valley is, but we'll find out someday. Annette from, oh, hi, Margarita from New York. We, we have like 114. Eileen Phoenix, I just flew through there. Ah, so you're all showing up. I see people from Canada, from Washington, from Wyoming. So my rule is when we get to over 100 people gathered here, we can start chatting. And today, I was thinking about the fact that we pack up all our stuff back at the ranch, I think in June. And then all kinds of things went wrong. And we ended up packing every bit of our stuff away about three weeks ago, putting them in pods, and then they're being driven across the country. So tomorrow they should actually show up. Wouldn't it be great if they did? I had a friend once who <laughs> hired the cheapest moving company she could find in Boston, put everything on their truck in Boston, flew to Phoenix where she was gonna live, and never saw any of her stuff ever again. They just drove it away. And when she tried to call them back, she got the FBI um, who were investigating this, this moving company that would just show up at people's houses, put all their stuff in trucks and drive it away to steal it. So yeah, I think she eventually got a little of it back. But it reminded me of a story. First of all, I'm so excited for my stuff to arrive tomorrow and not fancy stuff. This is like, Ooh, wouldn't it be amazing when I have two hairbrushes instead of one? Not that I need much for this, but like, ooh, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get almond flour tomorrow. I'm getting all excited about these things, and it reminds me of a story from the Sufi tradition. That, uh, in Islam, there's a sort of a holy fool archetype named Nasruddin, and Nasruddin's always doing clever, sort of holy fool thinks he's a trickster, right? So there's a story about Nasruddin walking along the road and he meets a man who looks terribly sad. And he says, what's wrong? And the guy says, oh, I'm, go I'm out looking for happiness. I I was born to a wealthy family. I'm a prince. I have all this stuff. I've had all the women I could ask for. I've had everything my heart desires and I'm still not happy. So I decided I'd just go out on a trip and on the road and start looking for happiness. And Nasruddin said, oh, very interesting. And then he grabbed the guy's sack where all his belongings were over his back. Nasruddin grabs the bag away from the prince and takes off into the forest, like my friend's moving company. And the prince, of course, is like bereft beyond description. And he just keeps walking because he doesn't know what else to do. Meanwhile, Nasruddin is cutting through the forest to a place 
that the prince has not yet reached along the road. And he runs out onto the road, which is not much traffic, puts the bag on in the middle of the road, just before the prince comes along the uh, around the corner, he run runs off, Nazardine, and hides behind a rock. And the prince comes around the corner, like, mm -hmm. and he sees his sack. And he goes and he looks into it, and it's got all his stuff. Like, Nazardine didn't touch a thing. It's all there again. And he starts jumping and dancing for joy. And Nazardine says from behind his rock, hmm, interesting what it takes to make some people happy. And I think this is this is one of my all-time favorite stories because have you seen uh, the comedian Louis C.K.? He does this routine called Everything's Amazing and Nobody's Happy. Like people get internet on a plane and if it doesn't work right, they're like, Dah! you know, this piece of crap, I can't believe they did. What kind of a place is this? He says, it's so amazing. Like they're flying through the sky in a chair and it, a machine is going to space to send them notes to their loved ones. And when it doesn't work right away, they get all ticked off. Like we're miserable so quickly. And what, how much joy, delight, gratitude, appreciation are we forgetting to extend from ourselves for the things that we already have? So um, I take this to a, a certain extreme sometimes. I like to if I'm criticizing anything in my life, I think about the fact that I have known people who had it much worse. And this generally doesn't work for me. It's like, oh, think of people starving all over the world. That just makes me more depressed. But for example, you may have seen in the paper, um, this poor young woman, um, she, she attempted suicide and she did not succeed in killing herself, but she destroyed her face. And so, for three years, she didn't really have a face. And then she had a, recently I saw in the news, she had a face transplant. She, somebody died and left as an organ donor, a face. And they had to reattach the face. It's amazing that they can do that. And my heart just breaks for this woman and her family. But, you know, I've never liked my face. But when I get critical of my face, I'm like, Ooh, I, I need Botox. I need, mm, I'm never going to get any work done because really what's the use? So I get into these, <laughs> into these negative spirals. And then I'm like, wait a second. If I had to choose between this and a face transplant and the agony that goes with it, I mean, why am I not grateful that I have a face that works, right? Like at least it's, it, it's a face. It's a workable face. It could be much, much worse. And it's like Nazardine getting his little sack of or giving the sack of belongings back to the prince. It's like, wow, what riches have I been given? And then I've been criticizing them. And I haven't really felt that way with my possessions, but the fact that they're coming tomorrow, I think I'm going to open those bags of the most ordinary things, hairbrushes, cooking supplies, you know, a coffee mug, and just be out of my mind with joy. But I wasn't every single day out of my mind with joy because I had those things in the place where I'm moving from. So I really want to start a practice this week. And I'd love you guys to practice with me where we go into not just like, oh, I'm so grateful for all the blessings I've been given in my life, but like really get in to something like everything you experience. This is the most amazing thing I have. I have a soda that has no no sugar or anything in it. Holy crap! I have an iPhone. I have. I have. Do you know what this can do? I can go anywhere in the world on the, on that thing. I can sit there and go to Google Maps and go visit the Eiffel Tower and look at it. And I can go and I did this once. Go to the Masai Mara after I came home from the Masai Mara, and I could zoom in from Google maps on this big stretch of wildlife and I could actually find herds of animals that had been photographed from space. I mean, what? In the in olden times, people if people got to go one cross-country trip or across the continental United States, it would be like the trip of a lifetime. It would take years and they would be like worn down to a nub and probably dead from malaria by the time they got anywhere. And I get to fly back and forth. I mean, I moved here. I flew back to LA. I flew back here. It was just, we live in this amazing time. 
And yes, I know I'm overprivileged even compared to like the vast, vast majority of Americans. But I wasn't always. And not everything I have is like, people think I have private jets and stuff. I am not that rich. But I have a Subaru. Like I have a freaking Subaru. And when I told my insurance agent about it, he was like, oh my God, that is the safest car. He got so excited. I thought he was going to faint because this car is so freaking safe. So what I want to do is every time I get in this Subaru, just go, I am in the safest freaking car on earth. This is amazing. I want to pretend every day that everything I have, including my face, has been stolen from me and then returned. Like I'm waking up from a nightmare. Now, there is a practical application to this in my experience. Um, enjoyment and luxuriating in what you have while at the same time allowing yourself not to be one of the, the puritanical, okay, I've had enough, I've had enough for one lifetime, to say, given that all this has found us, I mean, for almost everyone in the country to have a smartphone, inconceivable, even 20 years ago, 50 years ago, it was not even a twinkle in anyone's eye. So I want to rejoice in what we have at a deep, deep level, because when you do that and allow yourself to imagine even more, it's almost like it swings one way or the other. You're either disappointed and like, oh, I wish I had something better. Or you, you think, oh, I have so much, but that's all I'm gonna get. Both of these are scarcity thinking. So what about if we say, look what we've been given, what there is to be given to us is unimaginable. So why not start to think about it? Why not begin to, starting from how much we've already been given, to trust the universe to give us more and more and more joy? Because what attracts things that make us happy is the energy of happiness itself. What attracts the means that make us feel wealthy is to feel wealthy with what wealth we have. When I had, the first time I had $200 in my bank account, I just about went, lost my mind. I was so rich, right? So it's this interesting thing, especially in American society where we, we come from um, the Calvinist tradition where people tried to look like they were doing really well because it was a sign that God favored you if you did. So we want to do really well and sort of display our wealth. But at the same time, we also have puritanical roots. So we're like, oh, but I don't want to look too good and I don't want to be too happy. H.L. Mencken once described Puritanism as the, the sinking feeling that somebody somewhere may be happy. So we're, we're caught in this odd cultural dilemma. We are the wealthiest culture in the history of the world, and yet we're both Calvinist and Puritanical about it. And we get ourselves into all these knots where if we enjoy things the way the prince enjoyed the stuff in his bag along the road, that's what brings more things to us. I mean, imagine that guy jumping up and down on the road, so thrilled, radiating joy, don't you think people would have been drawn to him? Don't you think that would have made other people want to celebrate? Don't you think that would have made people want to give to someone who expresses such gratitude? My son, Adam, I've written about this. You know, you gave him a pair of socks for Christmas and most kids would be like, yeah, and he'd be like, oh my God, socks. I totally needed these. These are the most awesome socks. And so everyone wants to give stuff to Adam. So this is my thing for the day. Whatever you have in your house, whatever body you have, whatever part of it functions, it might be almost all broken, but part of it is still functioning and able to experience joy, delight, and pleasure. Whatever friendships and relationships you have, family members, whatever weather is out there, imagine that you just got it back after it had been stolen forever. Imagine how you'd feel if all of this abundance were showered upon you after you thought you had lost it all. And then feel that sensation. It's a combination of deep appreciation and gratitude. And that, my friends, is what brings in more. It's not because we should have more. It's not because we deserve more. It's, it's kind of, it's like Jesus's parable of the talents. The talent was a coin 
And Jesus told a parable where two servants were given one coin each by their masters, um, by the same master. One guy buried his so it wouldn't get stolen. He was coming out of scarcity. The other guy went to the market, bought something, then sold that other something, got more money, sold it again. He was basically investing. <laughs> he was working his way up. And then the master came back and he said, what have you done with what I gave you? And they tell him. And what the master does, when I first read this as a kid in Bible stories, you know, I was like, this is just mean. Because Jesus said, the master took away the coin from the one who had buried it. And to the guy who'd been basically making more out of his, he gave even more coins. And I thought, that's not fair. He should have taken, you know, he should have given it all to the poor, scared guy who buried his talent in the dirt. But I don't think Jesus was talking about what we deserve. I think he was talking about the way the universe works. And the way it works is that if you bury your talent, even what you have starts to leach away into fear and anxiety. And when you rejoice and appreciate and um, experience something, more comes to you automatically. And it's not a matter of justice. It's just a matter of it's kind of the physics of how abundance works. So I hope everybody has got at least something in mind. I hope you're looking around the room going, oh, my God. Like I'm looking around the room going, oh, my God, I have a friend who let me stay in his house. I was going to be in like a Motel 6. How awesome is my life? How awesome is this soda? How awesome is this face that I've so often criticized? So I hope you guys are looking at what you have to relish. And this week I want to really relish it, like consciously do it. So I don't know if you have any questions about this, but now's the time I'd like you to start asking. Um, okay, Mary Catherine, how you doing? What do you see as the difference between gratitude and appreciation? I was thinking about this today. This is how I understand it. Gratitude, it's usually a spontaneous overflow of, of um, beneficence, right? But we use it in our culture, I think in many cultures, as a way of diving under the other person. Saying, I'm so grateful. I'm little poor, stupid me that I've been given all this stuff. Ooh. I don't think that's the right tone for gratitude. Gratitude is an overflow of genuine appreciation. And here's how we can know exactly how it works. Dogs do it all the time. So a dog will not feel guilty if you give it a treat or a cuddle. A dog will not feel like it has to pay you back. A god, a, a god, hello, Dr. Freud to the floor. A dog will not say, oh, no, no, I couldn't, or feel like, oh, what, am I, what do I have to do in return? The dog is just like, oh, my God, a bone! Yeah! I'm doing an impression of my deceased beagle cookie. Oh! He just, he couldn't stop himself from howling in joy when you'd give him something. And we trained him not to howl, but he would, instead he would go, oh! Like, his, his enjoyment of, the, of whatever we'd given him was so immense that he could barely keep himself from howling. So real gratitude to me is that type of appreciation. Like when you take a bite of food, we had fried oysters the other night. I took a bite of a fried oyster and I just went, oh. and naturally the appreciation is so deep that it starts to overflow. And there were other people in this great oyster restaurant and everybody was in that state and people were like making friends and people were having fun just because everyone was tasting this amazing, delicious gift from the sea. So that's what I would say is don't dive under, don't feel less than, don't say, oh no, I couldn't. Just go for the gusto of life and that natural appreciation spills over and that's gratitude and that brings in everything. Ah, another question. Okay. Karen says, the gift of having too many choices, or so I seem to think I do, feels burdensome and confusing. I'm not looking for material things so much as I am for experiences. How do you get past the confusion and worry to make a choice to be able to move forward? Really good question. I think the way you do it is to take an action quickly without daring, without stopping to consider whether or not you dare do it. Um, because momentum 
is hardest at the beginning. In China, they say they have a proverb, the beginning is half the task. So if you have too many choices, just make any choice and go with it. Now, if you have what we call analysis paralysis, where you're just always thinking, but I have to do the best thing. I knew a guy who never read a book because he, he was looking for the best book for him to read in the world. And no book was at an absolute number one. So he never read any books. So we can get into this paralysis. But if you do any little thing that moves you forward, you start the momentum, the inertia starts to move forward and you begin to experience things. And here's the thing, you guys, it's not like we make one choice for one thing and that's it forever. Some, I met somebody in California in, in um, LA who, who was just shocked that I had sold my ranch because she's like, you dreamed of that. That was a magical place. And I was like, yeah, it really is a magical place. And now the magic's taking me to a different place. You can always choose again. You can always follow this path of gratitude and appreciation and things just appear. It's, it's astonishing. One of my favorite stories I like to tell is that I knew someone who worked with Gandhi in India and she told me, you have no idea how much money it took to keep Gandhi poor. Because people, here's this guy who didn't want to have anything but he was always trying to make the world better for people. He was in deep appreciation for everything he did have including things like his own experience of injustice and anger. He said, I harbor these things, they're precious, they motivate me, they're all gifts, they're all gifts. You know, he was rejoicing even in his oppression and in the feelings that it created. And because he was in this gratitude and appreciation all the time, people sent him money. <laughs> and he didn't want money, he'd taken a vow of poverty, so they had to deflect it. And they had to hire all these people to get the money out to the poor. Um, they kept trying to reach Gandhi. So, um, yes, yeah, so I've gone far away from the topic. I think I have. Getting away from the worry and doubt. Oh, yes. Get away from the worry and doubt. And um, again, just take any choice. Just appreciate any little thing. The next thing you eat or drink, just stop for a moment and make sure it's like if you make yourself a cup of chamomile tea, for example brew up the, the perfect temperature and get it the perfect um, intensity of flavor and maybe put a sprig of mint in there and then go to your favorite place in your abode, whatever that is, your refrigerator box, whatever it is. Find the most beautiful thing you can to look at and sip that tea while you look at the most beautiful thing you can find in the room. And just, I've seen Byron Katie, whose work I love, you know, I've seen her burst into tears at the taste of a bagel. I was, <laughs> I was eating with her once um, and we were at brunch at this um, hotel where you could load up your own lunch tray and they had all these things for bagels, like cream cheese and chives and lox and I, I don't even remember, chopped onion, all these things. And she got all the fixings, all of them. And she, she came to the table and she put a layer of cream cheese on it and then she put all these toppings on and she cut herself a piece with a knife and fork and she tried to eat it. And it was so loaded, it was too big to put in her mouth. She's like, hmm. So she puts it back down and she says to me, now watch. She took a knife and fork and she started cutting the bagel piece in two. And she said, this changes everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then she enjoyed that bagel. And then she took me on a tour of all the houses people have given her because she can't stop people. She keeps trying to give them away to the poor. Again, it's this living in absolute lush, and the, the deliciousness of every experience that just brings abundance. It just does, you guys. And we've all got something to enjoy. So any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Jesse says, how do you distinguish between yearning for something more and being ungrateful for what you already have? Can the yearning and the gratefulness really exist together? Yes, they absolutely can. I think that yearning is actually a gift that's given us. It's, it's our way of, pro, of, um, of previewing the future. Now, if you want something from a cultural perspective and you want it to impress other people and you want it to shore up your ego's sense of its own value, that's not gonna help you. It's gonna put you in the place where everything's amazing and nobody's happy. But if you're deeply, deeply in joy for what you have, and then you think, oh, 
guess what would be even better? This is how artists work, you know? They create something that looks beautiful or a musician creates something that sounds beautiful. And in the appreciation of that, I don't know if you've had this experience with the arts, but when I hear music that I really enjoy, when I read something really well written, when I see a painting that is really gorgeous, it, those are three areas where I like to try to be a little creative myself. And the enjoyment of that creates all of this new beauty, new potential for beauty. And then the yearning sets in to create. There's something I may have mentioned before, Carl, called sudden artistic output syndrome. And this occurs when part of the brain is damaged or even taken away. Like there's a guy who had his head, part of his head scooped away by an airplane propeller. And he became this impassioned sculptor. He started doing all these sculptures of animals and Native Americans. He became this brilliant sculpture. Sculptor. Another guy was an orthopedic surgeon. He got struck by lightning, damaged his brain. He started to hear piano music in his head, learned the piano, practiced 10 hours a day, became a composer, writing concerti for piano and orchestra. Now, and, and, and when you have this rare condition, sudden output, artistic output syndrome, you can't stop creating. Like the pianist actually lost his family. His wife divorced him. He's like, she's like, you're not a doctor anymore. You, you play the piano 10 hours a day. You've never played it before. Um, so they actually are driven. But here's the thing, you guys. That's what happens when part of the brain is damaged or removed, which means to me that what the brain actually is is not the source of creativity, but an inhibitory device that allows us not to be consumed by the urge to create, which is the natural function of consciousness. So if you can take that inhibition off a little by deeply enjoying something, creativity begins to flow through you at a really, really intense velocity. And sometimes it can get almost overwhelming. If, you, if you're enjoying a lot, your ideas for what's even better and even more beautiful become so compelling, you can barely think about anything else. You can barely sleep. And I know that it's like being in love. It's not a bad you can't sleep. It's like being in love. So I hope that's motivating. This may have been covered. This may have been covered. Elizabeth, are there specific ways of noticing and making space for your gratitude? Yeah, we have three minutes. I, I, we can use that. Let's do a little exercise. Okay, so let's do the Nasruddin exercise. Um, think of a person in your life whom you love, but the relationship's not perfect. Okay, so I'm thinking of someone. Now think, it, God forbid, they go on a plane somewhere and the plane disappears and everybody thinks it's crashed. And you lose this person from your life. Think about that. And you start to notice how the little annoyances and irritations, they're gone, obviously. And what you start to miss is the presence of that individual, the, the, the absolutely um, singular, non-reproducible tone that is that human individual. That nobody else will ever be that way or has ever been that way. And then imagine that the plane was discovered to have landed in some desert area and everybody got out alive and your loved one is back with you. And you could just make a decision right then to let all the crap die for good and just to relish the presence of this being that you can love and who loves you. That may be even hard for someone, but take, then take a possession like your computer. You know, people take these things for granted a lot. Um, let's say all the flowers you see today. Imagine that all the flowers got wiped out and there are no flowers. And you go around the world for two or three years and there are no flowers. And then they figure out what went wrong and all the flowers come back again and everything's blooming again. It's like, it's heaven, right? It's heaven, these incredible objects. I moved here from California and we had a, like a week of rain in Pennsylvania and Southern um, New Jersey. And a lot of people were saying, we're sorry, we're sorry about the bad weather. And we're like, are you kidding? Rain, rain, it doesn't rain for 10 months of the year in California, we're out dancing in the rain. Think of something, a weather pattern that, that goes away for a long time and then comes back. So this exercise of 
seeing things go away and then allowing them to come back in. If you really think you've lost something and then you get it back, you get this explosion of appreciation and gratitude. And if you can live that way in every moment, each given moment becomes the restitution of all these blessings. If you meditate long enough, you may have an experience where you begin to see that reality is, that material reality really is a creation of consciousness and that in every moment it's going away forever. Like the whole world disappears forever and then is recreated in the next nanosecond by consciousness. So it's really like a movie with different screens. And if you get really deep in meditation, it starts to go very slowly and you can see screen nothingness, screen nothingness. And you start to realize that, holy heck, this is being dreamed into being moment by moment by moment. And everything is a gift renewed. And anything I imagine deeply from my core that is different will start to manifest around me. This is where you start to get under the hood of the magic of the universe. And it comes from attention, but more specifically, attention to the appreciation for things that give us joy, that give us pleasure, that give us protection, that give us anything. And everything gives us something. So I'm just overflowing with gratitude today. And um, if my stuff never shows up, if it happens, it goes away like... Uh, my friend, my friends did long ago. Um, I get the wonder of getting new stuff someday. And if it shows up, I get my stuff back. Like the prince on the road with Nasruddin. So I hope we're all on that road today. And I just want you to notice moment by moment by moment, how much beauty, abundance, love, safety, gorgeousness is being given to us. And that gratitude, I really believe it is what keeps recreating the universe. I love you guys. You are, I am in such gratitude and appreciation for you. I can barely stand it. And I can't wait to see you again next week from a whole different place. It's gonna be awesome. Until then, just enjoy everything and tell me all the things that do come for you.